Approaches C with a plus. Coming from the right side. From the right. So we start on the right, and then we see as we get close to C, okay, uh, what value are we approaching? With C equals zero. negative one, we're getting close to zero. Yeah, because that's what we're getting close to. From the left, we're coming in, and we're getting close to two in the y values. So, and here the limit doesn't exist. Why? Approaching two different values. Classic excuse for limits not to exist. Um, okay, you want to find the limit if it exists, and how is that done? Multiply by the conjugates. So square root of x plus 2 times the square root of x plus 2. The nice thing about conjugates, when you multiply them together, you get the first thing squared minus the second thing squared, so we just get x minus 4. should write the limit as x approaches um, 4 from the left. Wait, why? What? Just the second thing squared, but then you put the negative 4. Why does, doesn't negative 2 and positive 2 cancel each other out? Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, they, I guess they do in a way, when you do the square root of x times 2, and negative 2 times square root of x, those two cancel each other out, but when you do negative 2 times 2, oh, okay. negative 4. Uh, here we get also an x minus 4, what a coinky dink. And the square root of x plus 2. Cancel them out. Great job, Logs. Yeah, they cancel out, and that, now we could just do this step all at once. We could put 4 in there. Two plus 2, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 2, 1 4. 1 4. Four. Four. Two of them, so, and we're up in Troy, so I don't think they'd start us out late. It starts at noon. It starts at noon. Oh. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Well, I didn't want to interrupt your class because you're like, stop talking, so I stopped, and then you made us walk. No, you did, did you're fine, thank you. I wanted to lighten the mood here. Bring some levity. All right, um, we're going to find uh, discontinuities in points at which f is discontinuous and state whether the discontinuity is removable. What does it mean, it mean if discontinuity is removable? Yeah, that's essentially it. Anything else like this is not removable. Uh, increasing without bound, that's not removable. Removable means we can fill it up with a dot. So it's How's it go? How do we find those how places? How do you know whether it's a hole or a horizontal asymptote? Vertical. Vertical. Yes? Okay. Well, how I figure out how you find a vertical asymptote or a hole it's because if vertical asymptotes are just going to infinity. And so what I just do is kind of like go one from one from the left and one from the left. And it's one of those two answers being really, really big as they're close to that point. Then it's going to be infinity. But if it's like kind of just going up steadily, uh -huh. you know, the next hand is kind of like in a pattern. Uh -huh. like one, two, three, five, six, seven. Yeah. Then that'd be a hole. That's how I see it. You get, so you're just plugging some values into yeah, it. a table. Yeah, you're kind of going back to like the first days of limits and just using yeah. a table. That's what I'm doing. Like Which, okay, that works, but also we have a better way. All right. A more accurate way. That because even sense. that, let's say that you get really close, and you're, where, where are we, well, say the point that has some discontinuity is 1, and you're plugging in 0 0.9 and 0.999 and 0.9999, and, and it's getting closer and closer and closer to something. It certainly seems that's working, but that's 
not guaranteed to work forever. That was to give us an intuition. But now that we have all these properties of limits and dividing one function by another, there's a more absolutely definitely sure way. Asymptote if it's zero on both? No. Oh. Okay. So there's a zero in the denominator only, and not a zero in the numerator. You got a vertical asymptote. Okay. And this next this next statement that I'm gonna make is assuming we're working with a rational function, which means two polynomials, not like uh, trig functions or something. Right. So this next thing, if you plug in a value and you get a zero here and a zero here then you're working with a whole. That works for polynomials, one polynomial divided by another, not <laughs> other functions. Okay, one polynomial divided by another. All right, well one way that we can find that out if we're gonna get a zero or we're gonna get, if we're only gonna get a zero in the denominator or if we're gonna get a zero in both, is to factor it, if possible. Can we factor these? Not this one, we can factor this one. As? Uh huh. Okay, so, for instance, if you put zero in, you're going to get a zero in the denominator, because zero times doesn't matter is zero. And zero, just zero is zero. So we're going to have zero over zero. So that's going to be what? A vertical aspect of a whole. A whole. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that also looks like these are common factors, right? If you have common factors, whatever zero is associated with that factor is a whole. Okay. So if the numerator and denominator share a factor, which these do x and x, mm -hmm. uh, whatever zero is associated with that factor, when you take that factor and you set it equal to zero and solve for x, okay. that zero, that number, that solution to that equation is a whole. Th that seems weird to say that because the solution would be x, or the, the equation would be x equals zero. Okay. But the zero associated with this factor is when you set this equal to zero and solve, you would get x equals one. That would be, well, in this case, it'll be a vertical asymptote because there's not a common factor. Um, but if there was an x minus 1, then yeah, that would be a whole in the, in the numerator. Okay, so uh, one place where there's going to be discontinuity because there's a 0 in the denominator is 0 because there's x right there. And if you plug 0 in for x, you get 0. So at x equals 0, we have what? Removable discontinuity. Removable discontinuity, yeah, a whole. Uh, so we could just say removable, and at x equals what? One. one. one you have non-removable. Non well, with negative one. Oh wait, never mind. I'm too good. Never mind. I'm wrong. Never mind. Okay. I thought I was smart. And I was like, <laughs> you're smart. I know. You're just wrong. You can be wrong and smart. You thought you were right. Yeah. Okay, determine whether the graph of function has a vertical asymptote or a whole. This sounds familiar, right? It's almost exactly the same question as 37, but slightly differently. Um, and actually, if you look at the book, number 30, the instructions say removable discontinuity. So, uh, so specifically, we're talking about vertical asymptotes being the kind of non-removable discontinuity. Okay, how do we approach this problem? Factor the numerator. Factor the numerator. X is x times x is x squared. I'm going to multiply to get negative 7. Uh, x minus 7 and x plus 1. 1. And you make sure that, that the, uh, the x term would be negative 6, which it would be. Okay. Well, we have common factors of x plus 1. So what does that mean? It's a whole. It's a whole where? Uh, negative one. Negative one. So at x equals negative one, we have a whole. And anything else to report? No. What about seven? Huh? No. It's just a point. It's just a point. It's a point at seven comma what? put seven into this function, what will you get? What's your output? Zero. 
Put, z put seven in there, you get zero. Zero times something is zero. Zero divided by something, still zero. Okay. So if you get a zero in the numerator and not in the denominator, you just get an x-intercept on the graph. But if you get a zero in both, you get a hole, and if you get a zero just in the in the denominator, you have a vertical axis. Okay. So we're gonna find the limit as x approaches zero from the left of this function. So what did you guys do? Common denominator sounds good. So this can become the limit as x approaches zero from the left of, pardon me, uh, x squared x cubed over x minus 1 over x. That's the limit as uh, x approaches 0, um, x cubed minus 1 over x. Uh, I tried doing difference of cubes, but I don't know if that worked or not. But anyway. Try to do dis difference of cubes, see if that works. Okay. That won't work. No. Right? Can I try this one? That is a difference of cubes, but that would work out to be a factor of x minus 1, and then this oh other thing. It's definitely not just a factor of x. We're trying to cancel this guy out right here, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a question. What if you multiply by, you get x cubed over x minus 1 over x. We just need a common denominator, so this is over 1 right now, so we're multiplied by x over x. Because we need a common denominator. Okay. What about just the denominator? What's that? If we just plug in. Plug in zero into here. Well, then we'll get divided by zero. Okay. Yes. Can we multiply by the reciprocal? Is that not allowed? Well, just cancel the term. You're suggesting that we multiply this, which represents uh, you know a, a value to be determined, okay. uh, and just multiply it by its reciprocal. Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing, like this rep once you put a number in for x, that will be a number, right? So this kind of represents oh, okay. a number. Never mind. So yeah, if I took two thirds and multiplied it by three halves, now I've changed it completely. I've, I've made it just a one when it wasn't one to start with. Okay. okay. Um, okay. Multiply by x over x. Yeah, but what would that do for you? Probably not going to work, but I was thinking maybe it would cancel out one x in the denominator and one x in the numerator, but I don't think that'll work because it's a subtraction, not multiplication. Right, right. So is that since the vertical isn't this a vertical class method? Why? Well it's like we can't really find you can't really find it. Well yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a vertical asymptote because because you got a zero in the denominator. But that doesn't tell us what the limit is. Where's it going? Is it going to positive infinity or negative infinity? Well, I'm just like looking at the, this is negative one over x, and it's going from the negative side. Okay, now we're, we're approaching it differently. I'm just like thinking of it, okay, if I think of it smaller, if the number gets smaller and smaller and smaller, it's going to be a bigger, bigger number. Okay, so but this is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Yes. In exactly. magnitude. Yeah. And since it's, if it's still negative, it's, it's on the negative, negative side. And it's going to be negative, not negative, negative, it's going to be a positive. Uh -huh. So it's going to constantly get bigger, and so it's uh -huh. going to be going to infinity. So what, what Aaron's saying is, one over, well, these numbers are close to zero. Numbers that are close to zero, very tiny, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.00001 or something. You divide one by a tiny number, you're going to get a big number of, uh, in magnitude. But he's saying they're negative, right? They're coming from the left of zero. So really big, but negative. Big, big negative number. Okay, uh, so a big, big negative number multiplied by a negative, positive. You get a positive big, big number. Okay, that's big, big old, big old positive number. Okay. What's this? That's gonna that's be a really tiny number. It's gonna be really tiny, it's gonna be essentially zero. So we're gonna get, yeah. Infinity. Great job, Aaron. There you go. Just think that through. I'm just thinking like, well, let me go back to the original. Super, super job, Aaron. Questions from the quiz? Mm -hmm. Questions from other parts of the homework? Yes. Yes. Number 14 on Yes. On what? Yeah. 1.14 and 1.5. 1.514. No, 1.4. 1.414. You don't even have 14, huh? Yes. Yeah. 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 Can I get three or ten?
I think you're the only person that's left. First, I'll address something that I think will clear up any confusion for, say, half of the people at least that, that might have confusion. And that is this thing. It's just a variable. It's just a variable. Can decide delta x, the whole thing, not delta and not x, but delta x, the whole thing, is just a variable. You could replace it with anything you want, any single variable. Delta x just represents, well, what does delta represent? Change. Change, right? Delta, change of x, change in x. So, change in x is it's just this thing that changes. It's just this variable. What? I thought there was a, another. Uh, it's like that's kind of where you said it was h. Right. We commonly will replace it with h. Okay. It will commonly be replaced with h. You can use any variable, but h is not. Huh? You can use any variable. Though. Yeah, you can use any. You could. You wouldn't want to use x, right? Because that'd be a little confusing. Mm -hmm. um, X and delta X are related, but they're completely different things. Okay, they're, they're separate from each other. Um, so we can replace all these delta X with H's, and that might help us to, to think about this whole thing. So that now when we work it through, we only have H squares and two H's and stuff like that. Instead of the H delta X squared. Um, okay. Well, what? We try to put zero in here. If we get zero in the denominator, that's bad. So we would like to be able to do what? See if we can find a common factor. Can you change all those h? Yeah. Make it easy. So you have to change the one and the Okay. Just. Yep. Okay. So we have any ideas? Yeah. Ideas. So if we just like square the thing. Square the things, okay? Square this, we'll get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus x plus h minus x. Oh, we don't have to even square there, it's just minus x squared minus x. Oh, geez, what did I do? Oh, my. I thought that was square. Cross, cross out that. Hard to cross out an x. <laughs> Well, now, there's everything left has a factor of h in it, at least one factor of h. So now we have the limit. Uh, h times 2x plus h uh, plus 1 over h. Just factor in the h out of all these. Factor out an h, you get left 2x, left is h, left is 1. So these get canceled out. Now we've gotten rid of the, the troublemaker, the thing that makes the denominator 0. So now we can plug what zero into here? It, oh, sorry, into here, into h, and what do we get? Two x plus one. Two x plus one. So we don't get four or one sixth or something like that number or infinity or anything like that. We get like it's like a new function, two x plus one. So that's neat. Okay. That's that was helpful. Yeah. Number thirty-five. Number thirty-five. For some reason, I thought x squared plus x was squared as well. But like, what? X squared plus x. And then square at the beginning here. 35. Oh, yeah. Did he say yes? Did he say yes? Yes, he said yes. Okay. So we're supposed to find. Ryan, please answer this question. Seven. Incorrect, try right? again. There's no discontinuity. Why? I'm not sure. Please decide. 
decided that? Did you just look in the back of the book? No, I decided that, that cosine x approaches zero, right? It approaches zero when? From the yes. Well, sure, it does. The value cosine of x does approach zero at certain points on the unit circle, but at other points it approaches one, and other points it approaches one half. At negative one, though, approaches zero. But why negative one? It's a negative one. I thought it was a negative one cosine x. Yeah, negative. So you take the cosine and you multiply it by negative one, mm -hmm. but then still the cosine could be anything uh, be between negative one and one. You say there's no discontinuity, so you mean it's continuous, right? It's always continuous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no no fraction on the zero. Okay. There's no fraction, so that you get a, a zero in the denominator. Yeah. But that's not the only reason you can have discontinuity, right? Yeah. Um, is it just because even if it's like the x and make three easy, like that part uh -huh. zero or cosine x zero, it's subtracting from each other, uh -huh. so like, you can still end up with well, could we still wind up with zero? Is it okay to wind up with zero? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can wind up with zero here. Because it does. Because you'll just get zero. Then yeah. the f of x, or the y value, will just be zero. That's okay. Okay. We're not just looking out for zeros, though zero in the denominator is probably the most common thing that we'll have to be like, you're making an imaginary number if there's no square root. Okay, there's another one. You could have the square root of a negative. Right. You could have uh, lots of different problems, but the thing is, <coughs> we have two functions, this one and this one. This one is a line, yeah, that's continuous. Yeah. This one is a cosine wave, that's continuous. Yeah. If I subtract a continuous function from a continuous function, the result is continuous. Oh, okay. okay. So there's no, there's no places where we have any issues. And Aaron, name some of them for us. You can have square roots with negatives in them. You can have the denominator zero. You can try to take the natural log of a negative number. You can, there's several different ones. But if we look at these and we investigate and ask ourselves, do these have any issues? Are there any places where this is undefined or this? No, everything's fine. No. Yeah. So, is, are there any other questions? 41? 41? Oh. Sorry, Aaron. Oh, say, like, what? You have some paper now? I was ready to go. Could be our, our last one. We got some tricky questions to look at. Oh no! Yeah. Oh boy! <laughs> this one's a tricky. Okay. Well, factor out the factor out the denominator. Out the denominator. X minus five and x plus two. Okay. And you can cancel out the x plus two and the x plus two, but that doesn't help. Anymore. Okay. Well, we can't cancel them out because we're saying this this is f of x, so that would be the same. But we know that they have a common factor now. Yeah. And we know that at negative 2, what do we have? Multiple or removable discontinuity, if we want to call it that. Um, we also have a whole lot of fun. Uh, and that's what it's asking to do. It's asking us to find out where there's discontinuity and whether or not at those places it's uh, removable or non removable. So we just said at x equals what? Negative 2. Negative 2, we have removable. removable. And is there anything else? At x equals 5? There's no. Non removable. Great job, Kimo. Thank you. Okay, let's have two more, please. There we go. Kevin!
again. Give me a vision. Holy hell. How are you? I'm great. How are you? It's good to hear. I'm doing super fantastic. Great. Okay. So individually, please, because the AP test is an individual test. So let's start individually and see how far we can get on as many of these as possible. start to collaborate. Yeah, 
about eight or so. test that's really helpful, I said it before or I'll say it again, is to kind of realize how far back you can be, like how, how early in the year you learn this stuff. It's, it, you get the feeling sometimes on the AP test that it's all this really advanced stuff that you just learned that, that might have been tricky, but some of it's pretty basic, uh, back to basic stuff, <laughs> definitions, okay? So this question can be answered by someone who has been uh, the definition of continuity. What's the definition of continuity? She wrote it down the other day. Some, some, some. There's like three things. Oh, uh, no. That have to be true. No holes, some jumps. What's that? No holes, Those are some examples of discontinuity, but there's a, a, a formal definition <laughs> that defines it very clearly that if you have these three things true about a function, at, at a place, at a point C. If f of c is defined, okay, f of c has to be defined. As x purchase c, f of x exists. Uh -huh. f of x equals the limit of x as it approaches c of f of x. Read that last part. f of 
of x equals limit as x approaches c of f of x. Of f of x. What'd you say, Sophie? F of c. F of c equals the limit. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see, those three things have to be true. So the first one was that f of c is defined, it exists. Okay, what is c in this case? I think it's, uh, yeah, right there. Is it continuous at negative three? That's the question. Is the function defined, this is the function, is the function defined <coughs> at negative three? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it is, right there. You see how negative three equal to negative three is just, you use f of x uh, when x is equal to negative three, so look at f of x, is that defined for x equals negative three? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay, so good, that's fine. Um, all right, so that's good. Then the limit, uh, the limit as x approaches c of, well, we're using g, so the limit as x approaches c of g of x, as x approaches negative three of g of x, it exists. Okay, so now if you go back to at least the informal definition of the limit, in that they approach the same value. Okay, so we have to see do they approach the same value as x approaches negative three? How do we know? Okay, but if this different function meets up, right, we're gonna have two separate functions. That's how a piecewise function works. Okay, are you guys having trouble remembering piecewise functions? Okay, piecewise functions. Um, let's talk about a piecewise function. Um, a piecewise function is a function that's defined in pieces. Okay, so it's piecewise defined. The way it's, bless you, the way it's cut into pieces is on the x-axis, we say, we define it somehow from negative infinity to some value, between two values, after some value, uh, use this function. And at some other x values, use this function. So between negative five and negative three, let's just mark that off. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, yeah, between those two values, we're gonna use f of x, which is the square root of 25 minus x squared. What'd I do? Negative two. Oh. So on that <laughs> interval, we're going to use that function, square root of 25 minus x, whenever that, or minus x squared, whatever that looks like. <clears throat> then uh, picking up at negative 3 and going on to positive 5, we're going to use x plus 7. So uh, I'll grab this yellow. So from here until 5, we're going to use this other function, x plus 7. <clears throat> So that white region we use that I've labeled the white function, and in the yellow region we use the yellow function. Uh, x plus seven is a pretty easy one. Graph. Uh, it's a line. It's got a y-intercept of seven and a slope of of one. Okay, so we go up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we follow our slope of one. So we're going to come down one and over one. or down three and over three. Okay. okay, so now we meet up where the other function is supposed to take over. Now should we put a closed or an open circle here? Open. Why? Because uh, it may or may not be. Like, uh, may or may not be, and this is not the function we use at three. Not at it's not equal to. That's the function equal to. That's the function we use at negative three. So maybe we'll get filled in by the other function if they meet up, if the limit exists, right? Because if they met up, that, that would define that. Okay. Um, so let's look at the square root of 25 minus x squared. Uh, let's see. Negative 3, that would be 4. Negative 3 would be 4. Negative 3 would be 9. 25 minus uh -huh. 9 would equal 16. Square root 16 would be 4. Yes. Okay. And then, let's see. Square root of function. Won't be plus or minus. Get. Well, plus or minus 4, yes, if you want to be 
Well, okay, so with the square root function, to, for it to be a function, we always will only accept the positive oh, okay. result. A good, good point to make. So it does equal 4 at negative 3. And at, say, negative 4, we get 25 minus 16, which is 9. We get 3. We get. Well, so <laughs> three, so step down there. And at uh, negative five, what do we get? Uh, zero. Okay, so we can at least connect those points. The question can be answered, though. It doesn't really matter too terribly much what uh, it looks like. We're just asking ourselves, is it continuous? It is continuous. The limit does exist. The limit is 4. And at the point, negative 3, the, also the, the y value is 4. So the y value of the function is equal to the limit. And, uh, and the function exists at negative 3. So all those three things met, yeah, it's continuous. And now if we were on the AP test, we'd probably need to state something like uh, the function f of x is continuous on this interval. x plus 7 is also continuous on this interval. So we know that as it, as it approaches uh, that value of negative 3, it's all going to be continuous. And if they meet up, then it'll just be one continuous function altogether. Which of the following correctly describes the discontinuity What do we have to say about that? C. 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 A whole at three and a vertical asymptote at negative three. Okay, how are we so sure? Because if you plug in negative three plus x, you get zero on both the numerator and the denominator. If okay. you plug in three, then you get a just on the denominator. Which, by its own definition, makes a whole at three. And if you plug in three, I think that's it. I think it's two holes. Two holes? Be sure, we're plugging numbers in and, and well, we know, we know that three is a whole since there's two common factors for that. Okay, mm -hmm. you're talking about common factors, so it means you, you found some factors? Yes. yes. Okay, so maybe we should factor these? Yes. Okay. X, X minus three, minus X three, plus one. X plus one. <coughs> X minus three. X plus three. So because they share a factor, what zero is associated with this factor? If we put 3 into this factor, we get 0. So because 3 gives us a 0 here and a 0 there, it's a whole. But negative 3, on the other hand, only gives us Yeah, it only gives us a 0 in the denominator, so it's an asymptote. So negative 3 asymptote and 3 whole. So yeah, C. Can we do the trigonometric one? Well, yes, but we can also do this one. We're doing them all. You have to leave? No, I just I want to know no. what the trigonometric one is. Okay. Uh, so, what what are your ideas for this? Multiply one? by the conjugates. Yeah. Okay, multiply by the conjugate. How many of you multiply by the conjugate of the denominator? <laughs> Several of you. But not all of Okay. Yeah, we can multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. You can multiply by anything in the numerator and denominator. And if you if you do try that, you'll find out it works out nicely. <coughs> you should get eight and watch this. Look at that. That's my answer. <coughs> so we get zero over zero, but luckily x minus six seven. They, they did it differently. They saw x minus sixteen as a difference of squares. Oh. X is the square of the square root of x. If you square the square root of x, you get x. 16 is 4 squared. So they've factored it as square root of x minus 4 squared of x plus 4. How do you know, though, that it's the square root of x is the square root of x, x squared? Uh, uh, well, 
experiences like this one, where that idea is like put out there, and and you realize like, oh, well, yeah, if I square the square root of x, so if you square root of x times square root of x, what do you get? X. x. Right. So this is a square, right? It doesn't have to be x squared to be a square. You could write square root of x squared, and it'll be a square. Okay. What? Not too much. Just the same. Okay. Now, you don't have to do it this way. Does it work if you multiply by the conjugate? Yes. It does, but it's not bad to, to have that idea in the back of your head to think, you know, always examine the idea of difference of squares. It's a really common thing for people to throw into problems like this. But that's not all that there is. You can multiply by the conjugate. And it works the same. You, you had better get eight. Because we're, we're following math, we're using math, okay? So this becomes this, that's exactly what you get if you multiply by the conjugate, you get cancellation and you get the square root of x plus four, and you plug in 16, you get eight, okay? Now it references this other thing called L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule is for a BC class, okay? We might get to L'Hopital's rule and we probably won't get to L'Hopital's rule, okay? Um, but it also works. And you use it in instances where you get zero over zero or infinity over infinity or uh, negative infinity over infinity or any, anything weird like that. Okay, those are called improper. All right, so let's come over to the trigonometric one, the one that you're all so excited about. Just can there, actually. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Some ideas you have. Well, I just shoot it. I just kind of since I know that's that's the, the cosine, right? Not one, not one, but this is a cosecant. Cosecant. Oh, so I just I was just going. I was just seeing if I can go one over cos over one over tan. I mean, you can normal. Well, but this one, one you may have forgotten. One oh, sine. it's one, one over sine. sine. Oh, I can't remember which one. So this is one over sine, sine squared x over one over sine one over tangent. Sine. But hey, how about Cosine over sine. Ah. Um, there we go. Because you multiply the numerator by the denominator yeah. reciprocal one. And yes. Yeah. So you'll get your sine squares canceled, and you'll get what? One, one, one over cosine, cosine squared x. New function. Can you plug zero into this to evaluate that limit? Yes. Yeah. What do you get? One over one, the cosine of zero is one. One over so and square that, that, you get one. One over one, so we get one. I that there it is. So, the hospital. you find, well, I just didn't remember this, but when you do the cosine squared x, you find the cosine of the x and yeah. square that. Yes. Okay. So what, uh, <laughs> what Kendra was just saying, in case you didn't catch it, is that what cosine squared means? This is just a note to the side. Cosine squared x means take the cosine and then square the result, finding the cosine of that. Okay? And notice, I think this is kind of funny, these are Spark Notes uh, flashcards. And uh, it says the limit can also be found with L'Hopital's rule, the same one that this one mentions, is, but it says it's more annoying. <laughs> so, some, some real stuff. They're honest. <coughs> okay, so I will uh, I'll leave those up so that when the notes are in the PDF, there'll be the solutions to the questions. Um, and I don't know if it will sound cheesy or if I can convey it fully to you, but I'm really proud of you guys. I'm watching you talk to each other about these problems and say, you know, I think it's this and I think it's that, and you're not just being quiet, you're comfortable with each other, and you're throwing ideas out there. Oh, and if we make a habit of that, if we do that day after day after day, it's, it shows first that you are working on it to start with. If you come with ideas to a, a group you know, meeting, like two people or three people, um, it means you are working on it yourself. And uh, another thing is, 
when we get all when we get down the road, what we're gonna have since we're recording all these, we're gonna have this collection of all these different kinds of AP problems. They're all worked out and explained, and it's a, it's a really useful tool if we're studying for the AP test. Right? So it's a pretty cool tool that we'll have uh, as we move along. So don't forget that it's there. Don't forget that we're recording these, and you can go back and review them. Uh, if you do watch them and you think of something that we can do to make them better, then just let me know. Any? Can you find a way to move the pen with it? Move the pen with it? That's really hard. The pen. Like when we're up there and they're watching YouTube thing, and uh, you'll like often point to something with your pen, and you'll like go around and stuff, uh -huh. and you can just. But you can't see that on the YouTube video. Can't see the pen. No, I don't think so. Not the one that I watched. That's why I, I try to get the pen close and point at stuff so you can see magic. Is the whole AP test in our calculator? No. There's there's multiple choice and then there's free response. Some of the free res some of each is either or. Some the first part of uh, multiple choice is no calculator. Second part is calculator. First part of uh, the free response I think I think it's the same. No calculator. No calculator. Will they supply us a calculator if they just don't like the type we have? Say again? Will they supply us with a calculator if they don't like the one we use? I will. They, right. you know, they is Mrs. Williams. <laughs> 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 uh, but there are restrictions on what you can use. And I think TI 86 and up are, are out. So Inspires are out. <laughs> Uh, but I have I have something that you can borrow. What do you have? I've got a few more questions. Okay. Well, today we're gonna be doing the AP test. Yeah. Oh, that's not it. I'll I'll find out for sure when we get closer. I don't know how to get it, so it's a vacuum. I have this chair. Anything else? This is a. A review day, so I'm going to pass out some new materials. It doesn't even turn on. Wait, so we're not just it was dead. Next class, yep. Review day? Yes, next class. Uh, it's my No, no. No! no. 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 What? What? College fair. College fair. College fair. I'm going to have to let it down. How many people are going to be gone for college fair? Oh. Maybe. It's too many people. Too many. Okay, I think we'll... We'll have extra long review time, I guess. Yay! Yay! Yes!